no se olvida jamás, jamás. Es que han quedado huellas tan grandes como las olas del ancho mar. Good afternoon, everyone. Buenas tardes. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Amy Skillman, and I am the director of the Master of Arts program in cultural sustainability here at Goucher College. Before I introduce our guest for this hour, I want to say that any discussion of equity must begin with an acknowledgement of the historical and systemic inequities that have shaped our nation. We owe our existence to the communities and the ancestors who have come before us. So I would like to honor the elders of the Piscataway people whose land was stolen by European colonists and also to recognize the enslaved people who lived and worked on the land where Goucher College now stands. This conversation today is a small attempt to recognize and begin to right those wrongs. We do have closed captioning for you today. It's available by clicking the CC button at the bottom. You can also hide the closed captioning in the same way. And I wanna thank Koresh for providing live human captioning. We also have chat enabled so that you can interact with each other, introduce yourselves. But we do have Q&A as well, and we will have a Q&A session at the end. Um, so if you have specific questions for our speaker uh, that you would like to discuss at the end, please put them in the Q&A. We are recording the session today so that those of you who, so that people who are not able to attend will also have a, a recording of it. And you'll be receiving an announcement or an email about that probably in the next week or so. And then finally, remember that your passcode to enter all of the sessions also gets you into the Goucher Cafe, which is an ongoing running open room where conversations are happening beyond these uh, presentations. And we'll put the link to that um, both now, there it is, and um, in the chat, and we'll put it in at the end as well. So now let me introduce our guest for this session. Norma Elia Cantu is a colleague and a friend whose work occurs at the geographic, cultural, and gender boundaries of our time or borders. Um, she currently serves as president of the American Folklore Society and as Murchison Professor of the Humanities at Trinity University in San Antonio, Texas, where she teaches Latinx and Chicanx studies. A daughter of the borderlands, she focuses on the U.S.-Mexico border for her research and scholarly work, as well as her poetry, her fiction, and her personal essays. She has co-edited over 10 books on a number of subjects, including art, STEM, Texas studies, and folklore, such as Chicana traditions, continuity and change, as well as Dancing Across Borders, Danza y Bailes uh, Mexicanos. <clears throat> she has received awards for her work from the Modern Languages Association, the American Folklore Society, and the Tejas Foco of the National Association of Chicana and Chicano Studies, as well as the University of California, Santa Barbara, and mo perhaps most importantly, uh, numerous community organizations. She co-founded Canto Mundo, a national poetry organization that cultivates a community of Latinx poets from, through workshops, symposia, and public readings. She is a member of the Macondo Writers Workshop founded by Sandra Cisneros as a, ga as a gathering of writers, artists, scholars, and activists. She currently serves on their board, as well as the board of the Esperanza Peace and Justice Center in San Antonio, Texas. Her research and creative writing have earned her international reputation. In fact, I had the pleasure of hearing her read from one of her most recent books, uh, Cabanuelas, at a small bookstore in Santiago, Spain, when we were there attending a conference together. 
So I'm really thrilled that she's able to join us today because she has explored this notion of cultural equity, both in her scholarly writing, as well as in her poetry and fiction and in her community service. So our goal for this day long symposium has been to explore equity through many lenses. And for the MA in cultural sustainability, it's really a cultural lens that is of interest to us. And so what does cultural equity look like? So first of all, welcome Norma. It's so wonderful to have you here with us today. Thank you, Amy. And I'm um, now going to go ahead, I guess, and share my screen. Right, so we'll begin with a presentation um, by Norma and um, maybe some questions in the middle and then we'll move to questions and answers at the end. Sounds like a plan. <laughs> okay, great, thank you. Muy buenas tardes, good afternoon everyone. It really is a pleasure to be here and thank you so much to Amy, of course, and Goucher College, Lexi, who's been assisting us and all the staff there who have made this possible. It's a wonderful day long event. I hope you can join some of the other speakers throughout the day. Uh, for myself, I'm going to be talking about hauntings and identities, cultural futures. Over the last two or three months when Amy and I were talking about the topic, it seemed to be something that I wanted to explore as I am now going on with some other uh, kind of investigations beyond what I've been doing. And this is kind of a new area in theorizing or thinking about these hauntings. I begin to give you just a, a sense of the outline with some key terms and then some theoretical approaches that I use in my work and then some examples of sustainable and transformative action in the community where I am. And I would like to acknowledge the spirits of this place where I am, where I live and work, Yanawana, that is San Antonio, Texas, the Coahuiltecan word for the name of the people who you were here, the Payaya and who are still here is Yanawana. And uh, I also want to talk a little bit about how, because of the questions Amy and I discussed, how I interweave this research that I do in my community with my creative writing and also for building equity and how this cultural lens for practice and transformation kind of invades everything that I do. And then we'll come up with some conclusions. So first, let me begin with this the key terms. And I, the first term that come up, comes up for me is cultural equity, because equity, I think on some level has been overused, has been used to mean all kinds of different things. From a cultural administration perspective, for example, from Americans for the Arts, we have this definition. I'm not going to read it to you, don't worry. But it is, I think, a concept that can change situationally, depending on who's using it, for what purposes. Normally we think, or at least I've been thinking about it in terms of access. How do people of all kinds of intersections come to the cultural spaces that we create? But also how do all those um, cultural productions from these different groups come to the forefront? Who highlights why? in museums, at universities, wherever the space may be. That's what I mean by situational. And then the other comment or the other term that comes up is cultural sustainability. Um, yesterday we were at a webinar that was amazing, sponsored by the fellows of the American Folklore Society and the public programs section. And it was just amazing how much, uh, how rich this term can be because it is about sustaining culture. It's not necessarily about preserving and kind of keeping that foot in the past, but going forward to the future. And of course we talk about belief, we talk about traditional practices, folk knowledge, which could be anything. Uh, I was telling my students the other day from hair, how one wears um, hair, how you comb hair, all the different plating traditions, trenzas that we use. And then of course, the term that I'm kind of testing here uh, with hauntings. And I think Kay Turner, um, used it, uh, I don't know, it was a while back at, at a paper that I read 
uh, talking about art and ghost things. Well, this is taking it in a different direction. Hauntology, I kind of get it from Derrida, very kind of about cultural memory. It's more about how we, first of all, as scholars, but also the practitioners, the artists are haunted by that past, but we also are creating a past as we live it so that we will be the hauntings of the future. And that's where the cultural futures idea comes from. So it's not just for ghosts, it's about ideas and practices. And then the whole idea of this practice and the theoretical framing for looking at those practices, those beliefs. How do we enact those theories? How do we embody the knowledge? A term that Chicana feminists have been using for a long time um, back in, I don't know, it was in the 80s when Cherry Moraga and Gloria Ansaldua co-edited um, this bridge called My Back, Radical Writings by Women of Color. That was the notion that they were playing with about the embodied knowledge that we as women of color bring to any enterprise, whatever we're doing. And so what are some of these theoretical frameworks that inform my work? And this is one of the questions that Amy and I um, talked about throughout. I'll be kind of anchoring my discussion on these questions. It's definitely rooted in Anzaldu and philosophy. I'm the founder and executive director of the Society for the Study of Gloria Ansaldúa, and that's another story. But Ansaldúa, Gloria Ansaldúa, who wrote mostly in the 80s and 90s, passed away in 2004 from complications of diabetes while she was a doctoral student in um, Santa Cruz at UC Santa Cruz, published several anthologies of her most known work, Borderlands La Frontera, is where she lays out some of her concepts and ideas that she develops in later writings. One of those is about intersectionality, how we are multiple, um, ex we have multiple existences, we live in different things. We are queer, we are spiritual. Uh, and then of course we have feminist approaches. That's another main area that I kind of base my work on. Uh, some of it is ecofeminist, but only very recently, and, and I'm not, I, I don't call myself an ecofeminist because I don't know enough about it. Other scholars are doing much better uh, job at, at approaching things from that. However, I've always done kind of holistic analysis, and in a way, always rooted in that love for Mother Earth. So I call myself an ecofeminist, sort of. <laughs> and then, of course, critical race theory, which comes to us from legal studies, but that a way I know it more is through education and the educational practices that kind of unpack all of the um, racial, racially based or race based ex uh, policies in education, but beyond that, with ideas about microaggression, about master narratives that, of course, function in any kind of situation social situation. And most recently, I have been reading Donna Haraway's book from 2016 about making kin. And there's the connection again with the ecofeminist or the um, kind of more global um, and non-species centric perspective. So it's going beyond just Chicanisma. And then survivance, which is a word I get from Gerald Wisner, a um, Native American scholar and thinker, because it is about survival. If you have to sustain something, you have to survive. And it is also about endurance. And so it, it's survivance. And then in a way, like I said earlier, deconstruction, kind of breaking things apart to see how they are constructed and how they work with us. My training, my formal training is as a semiotician. My graduate work at the University of Nebraska was with um, people who were doing semiotics back in the day, in the late 70s, early 80s. So a lot of my work has that. And um, Amy mentioned a couple of the books that I've worked on, anthologies like Danza y Bailes Mexicanos, Dancing Across Borders, where the analysis there is pretty much a semiotics analysis that I do on one particular 
traditional dance in Laredo, the Matachines. So that's about where I'm coming from in terms of theory. It's an amalgam. It's really hybrid. I am crossing ar around all of these. And it's mostly situational. Depends on what I'm looking at, depends who I'm with, in terms of the person that's working with me on the project. That's kind of the approach that surfaces. I don't like to um, perpetuate boxes and keep um, the studies in different in little boxes, even with my creative writing. So I open it up and I find that it is much more fruitful. It is much more collaborative and in a way for me, exciting and intellectually stimulating because then you are, you're able to, you're, you give yourself permission to create, to go beyond what has been established. So one of the examples- Norma, if I about, can- Sure, I, I go have ahead, one, Amy. one quick comment on that. I think it's really interesting because you talk about the intersectionality of identities, um, you know, to, to, to actually have this very um, interdisciplinary um, theoretical framework, I think sort of maps nicely on top of that idea of our own intersectionality as identities. So thank Absolutely. you for illustrating yes. that nicely. Yeah. yeah, thank you for the comment because it does, it, it underscores that um, multifaceted existence mm -hmm. we all inhabit. Mm -hmm. yeah, Good. Thank you. Yeah, and the example that I want to focus on is because of my work with the Esperanza Peace and Justice Center, I am currently on the board, but I've worked with them for about 30 years now. Uh, these are three spaces in San Antonio where some of the work happens. And of course, it goes beyond that into the community. The, uh, the main event space on San Pedro is uh, kind of the building belongs to the organization. All of these buildings do now. But it, it was the center, it was the heart. And then the Casa de Cuentos, the one in blue in the middle, oh, that is, is a space where a lot of oral history happens. The, our Day of the Dead event is there. It's next. Actually, the Mujer Arte Studio is built in the back of that lot. And it's an exciting space where Mujer Arte is, is based. It's a collaborative of women who do ceramic work. But there are all the other artists that come through the Esperanza. And I'm going to talk about two particular things with the Esperanza. One is the example of embodied knowledge I was talking about earlier. Uh, National Heritage Award winner Veronica Castillo as a ceramicist here in San Antonio and began when she first moved to San Antonio as a teacher at Mujer Artes. She comes from Izúcar de Matamoros, Puebla, where the tradition of Árbol de la Vida has been around for generations. She immigrated to San Antonio in 1995 with the help of the Esperanza and began working there, teaching the, the art. She got the National Heritage Award in 2013 and then opened a gallery that is still functioning, even through COVID, although it's been hard. Uh, where she exhibits other artists, where she has events, poetry readings, um, demonstrations, a summer internship, uh, workshops for children, all kinds of community activities. Veronica's own art is just exceptional, as you can imagine, from a, a Heritage Award winner. Um, but she's always very rooted in community. Um, she learned the art at home with her parents and grandparents great-grandparents. And so she's teaching her daughter as well and keeps working with that community through teaching. This is in the gallery. This is part of the, the gallery where she also has a little shop. And then this is the Arbol de la Vida in a more traditional sense. The Archangel May and Michael is up there because already you can see some of the influences from the Spanish. But this was the original, uh, the ancestral image, if you will where the, um, um, in the content is based on nature. It's not necessarily Christian, of course. It includes animal and plant life of all kinds. And it includes some narrative elements, especially because often it was presented at weddings or other life ceremonies. And the arbol was constructed, was built around the narrative of that event. And this happened 
it still happens actually. Also, it was at some point a salmerio, and they still make these. That is an incense burner for ceremony. So you can have, again, plant and animal life, decorating it, the connection with Mother Earth. And then this one that is more Christian, or Judeo-Christian, because it is the creation story. Adam and Eve at the bottom, uh, Father God at the top, all kinds of flora and fauna at the different stages of the seven days of creation. And then this one that is also religious, focusing on a cofradia. A cofradia is like a little group within the church um, structure. Many churches have cofradias for different saints and they honor that saint. Uh, this one has, as you can see, again, the flora and the fauna, but it also has the religious images. There's a priest down here, and then um, the devotional elements, and then the um, monstrance up here. So, um, and, and it also is a candelabra. If you can see, there's these little spots all around. That's very typical of the Arbol de la Vida. But Veronica, being who she is as an artist and as a, a thinker, takes that tradition and, is, and haunted as it is by elements of her great, her ancestors, creates a new one. This one in particular just stunned me when I first saw it. It is Arbol de la Muerte Maquilando Mujeres. And she made it specifically for an event at UCLA around the issue of the women that were being murdered in Juarez, El Paso area. She created it with these gory images. She told me it was one of the most difficult pieces to create because of that, because of the content. And yet she felt that it was a kind of a healing that was happening just through making it. At the very top, you do not see a Christian father god. You see Coyol Chauqui, all dismembered, a goddess from uh, the Aztec uh, pantheon, and of course, death, and so many other elements. I'm not gonna have time to go through all of them, but she's very much now concerned with issues that are happening, social justice issues. And this one on global warming is another example of that. And so is this one um, that is a more personal kind of rebirth. So again, you have Archangel Michael, but you also have uh, elements from her life and her rebirth as it were, <coughs> excuse me. Um, she goes back to mother earth and to the, in this case, it's the mother of corn or a corn mother, uh, an image that is very familiar to native people all over the Americas because corn is a life giver. It's one of the three sisters. And then you have Mujeres Abrazando la Tierra, La Madre Tierra. And so the women are circling Mother Earth, protecting her. There's corn and the butterfly, the symbol of the butterfly is consistent. She uses it quite a bit. And then El Pueblo Defendiendo a la Madre Tierra. So Earth is being protected by the people. And if you can notice that this too has the candelabra and then the, the different images. At the threshold of blue corn's agony, again, going back to the idea of corn and how endangered it is because of the, um, the companies like Monsanto and the, high, the way that they have messed with the genetic code for corn. So she's reclaiming some of that. And then this Madre Tonantzin, which is Mother Earth again, the goddess Tonantzin was a, an earth uh, goddess. And, um, and she then um, kind of puts it all together. And so my point that I have been thinking about, and I'm working on a book with Veronica, I actually had wanted her to write it, but it looks like I'm gonna have to kind of um, work with her to create this book. It's about all this knowledge that she brings forth from her ancestors and how she transforms that tradition in creating this new future and where she wants her art, but also the message the art conveys to go. I'm so sorry about this. Uh, spam risk. <laughs> and so, um, Veronica is kind of an example of the artist scholar, if you will, because she takes great care 
in learning and in studying and doing the research and talking to people, but it's mostly a personal one. The next artist I want to show very briefly is Adriana Garcia, who's a muralist and also takes great care in researching and preparing her work. And as a child, she says she used to go drive by this particular mural on Saltillo Street on the west side of San Antonio and was intrigued by it. And I think the seed was planted very early about becoming an artist. Her family are artists. One of her uncles was a, a painter as well, an artist. Uh, her father, a musician. So this mural was one of the first that she was commissioned to create for a mental health clinic here in San Antonio. It is called Brighter Days. And when she explains the construction and how she went about it, she sat in the clinic for many, many hours talking to clients, patients that would come in and getting to know that community and what was the inspiration that she then came from, came forth with. Another inspiration is the Virgen de Guadalupe, reconfigured here. Uh, this one is called Standing Tall. And when she talks about the, the process, she goes back to um, Yolanda Lopez, a Chicana artist who did many images of, of the Virgen. And then this triptych that I find fascinating, we used it in one of the covers uh, for the Anzaldúa conference one year, I think it was in 2012, where she, she's got all the symbols, the hummingbird, um, the moon, all of the different ones. And if you notice, you can move the pieces around. The centerpiece stays the same, but the other two are interchangeable. And the message is still there. And I think it's just a beautiful piece. Her, one of her most recent things in 2018, San Antonio had a 300th anniversary celebration and she got the commission to do a mural at San Pedro Springs, the watering area near where I am now. And here's a kind of a detail, there she is in front of it. And there she is, or here is a, a kind of a, a close up of one of them. She really was telling us, I had her come visit my class and she was telling us about the process and how she did several um, groups, kind of community groups that then would contribute to it. Here is the one of the, actually the most recent one. This is a, it's called Changing the World. And she did it for a community college here in San Antonio. And again, that collaborative aspect of it, uh, unlike Diego Rivera or Siqueiros who had the idea and would go out and, and create the mural, uh, she takes a different approach, still within the tradition, still working with murals, with painting, definitely imbued with all kinds of cultural aspects, the tales, the I didn't point out the swallowing one of the others, but the uh, folk tales that are around the community. In this case, she visited with the students and one of the things they wanted to commemorate was the walkouts in the 60s here in San Antonio. And the students demanding uh, Chicano studies and having, uh, you can see it's during Vietnam, it's college, not Vietnam better books, better education. And the people who were actually marching in that photograph were in attendance when she opened the, when they had the celebration for the mural at the college. It was a beautiful event. And the students who participated, and I wish I had the time, I could do like a whole hour just on, the, on this work. But Adriana is another one of those that is haunted by that past, by the traditions of her ancestors and bringing it forth through her own and pointing to the future because she's not gonna stop. She's gonna continue working with it. Her most recent participation was a mural to honor Vanessa Guillén called Entre Todas Las Mujeres Among All Women. And the mural, if you know the story, Vanessa Guillen was murdered here in Fort Hood. And so this is kind of the signature on the, on the mural itself. This is the draft as they were working on it. 
And as they were painting it, there it's her. And this is the final one. If you can see on the bottom left hand corner of that wall is where the signature is. It's outside of a fruit market on the west side. A lot of people go by there. It was hard to find a photograph where it didn't have all the other stuff in front of it because it's always full of people. But one of the things that really impressed me is how the community rallied around Vanessa Guillen and she wanted, Adriana wanted to honor her mother, Vanessa's mother and sister because had it not been for them, they would not have found her body. They would not have continued the inquiry um, the situation of sexual harassment in the military would not have been highlighted the way it has been. So she really feels that her work is promoting social justice and working for the community to do that. And notice that the butterflies are here as well. Um, there's the mother and there's the sister and there's Vanessa. And there's a ceremony that the local indigenous group um, had the women of the group had at the opening of the event of the of the mural when it was unveiled. So in the past, in the present, uh, traditional forms haunt our present. They are elements of the tradition that persist, that haunt, and new forms emerge. So there's potentiality, there's futures, and what you see at the bottom is the full mural of um, Adriana's at San Pedro Springs along that long, long wall. I think it's 117 feet is what she said. So it's, uh, and she points, the, the center point is now, and then the two, um, the east and the west are the past mm -hmm. and they come together in the present. So, and the future is there, that potentiality. So she's kind of enacting the idea of hauntings that I'm working with and bringing it forth. It is cultural memory, but it's transformed for the future. So one of the questions that we- Norma, were, can I- um, Yeah, please, can I, Amy. Let, let's, uh -huh. take a, let's take a quick pause, uh, like take a little pause right there and see if anybody has any questions okay. at this point um, about these two artists. It looks like somebody just posted one. Marilyn. Now, can the haunting be recognized for what it is if one doesn't know the history? Interesting. It's a very interesting question. I would say yes, despite the fact that you may not know the history, the elements of tradition are still there and are being passed. It's like even you know when people say, uh, bless you when someone sneezes. You may not know <laughs> the history or the real reason why you say that, but you still do it. Uh, mm -hmm. I would think it's something like that. So that if there are elements in that tradition that are still there, um, the, hun the hummingbird um, image appears quite a bit in, in art, especially in the murals and things like that. I don't think everyone knows that that's the symbol for Huichilopotli, an Aztec god who was the one who told the Aztecs to go south from Aztlan and establish Tenochtitlan. And yet the symbol is still there. The, the use of that image is still there. That's what I would call a haunting. Even if you don't recognize it for what it is, it is there and it gets transmitted perhaps even with a different meaning. So another, um, Adriana and I were talking about this one time and she was telling me she loves the hummingbird, not just because of Huichilopotli, but because it is a bird that flies backwards and not birds don't do that. So for her, it's also a symbol of that past and the future because it can go to the past and to the, front, uh, and to the future. So it, it can have meaning beyond that, the one that it was there in historical memory. Yeah, that's a great question, Marilyn. Yeah. Well, and I'm thinking, you know, I just finished reading Cabanuelas, your newest novel, and the character in that feels like she's continually haunted by the pull. It's actually a pull to go home, a pull to go back to family, a pull to go back to tradition, back to what's familiar. Um, it, it is that 
Does that does that feel? I mean, it's a, it feels like it's that longing, uh -huh. but it but it also is a transformation. Right, and Nena in the novel uses the Portuguese word saudade mm -hmm. for that home yearning. It's not necessarily just homesickness, but there's some of that um, yearning for the past, but also for what is home, whatever that may be. Of course, it includes all the traditional aspects because she left behind. If you remember at the beginning of the book, there's a tamalada uh, of people are making tamales. And so that's kind of what she's yearning for, that that rootedness that comes with those traditions. And yeah, definitely uh, añoranza in Spanish. Añoranza and a little bit of, um, I don't know what else to call it. It's all of those words, it's saudad, añoranza, homesickness, home yearning. Um, and uh, maybe it's a haunting, yeah. Yeah, that's kind of what I was thinking, great. Well, thank you. So let's move. Yeah. So um, I don't see another question. It says, uh, it, well, no, just a comment in the chat. I don't see Sankofa. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. Thank you. I just wanted to pause for a minute. Oh, wait. It looks like maybe there is. Uh, can you say a little bit about why haunting and not ghosts? Yeah. <laughs> Obviously, ghost has a connotation in our mind about spooky spirits that come back to quote haunt you and it this is beyond that it's a different sense of haunting not necessarily ghosts that's what i put it on there it's not all about ghosts and when i talk with my students about it we're, we're in my folklore class we're doing belief right now and so in a way it's kind of the comfort of having that there's a sense of comforting whereas ghost does not for me mean any kind of comfort. It, it can be scary. And in popular culture, that's usually how it's used. And in ghost stories, often used to kind of spook people. I mean, uh, you could call La Llorona a ghost, mm. the wailing woman that comes mm. back to retrieve her children. Uh, but that's not a haunting in the way that I'm using it. Yeah, good yeah. question. Yeah, it is. And ghosts, it seems, are sort of they're individualized, right? And um, whereas haunting is this sort of more ephemeral sense. Yeah, anyway. Ephemeral and communal because it is yeah. a tradition. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh. Good. So uh, do you want to go to the next question? It was the one we talked about a little bit about um, how I use some of these models and strategies for building equity yes, through the work. And uh, I think especially with both Adriana and Veronica as examples, but there are many others. And I'm sure all of the folklorists in the room or on the other side of the screen can think of ideas or, or instances where you can, there's an opening for creating equity. Equity, not necessarily in terms of um, the intersections that we usually refer to, but of access as well as of production or not just being invited to the table, but being able to contribute to that table and not just being a guest sitting there, but be integral to whatever discussion is going on. I have often in my career, and I've been around for a long time, have been invited to that table, but not included. And, and you can tell right away whether it's a serious commitment to equity, where people are interested in ideas of achieving equity, of making events happen, for example, a museum exhibit or um, a festival, where it truly is collaborative community coming together to create something that is gonna be enriching. And that is also gonna be in some capacity allowing for social justice to kind of highlight things. It could be a difficult conversation or it could just be a celebration, but it, it has a different tone when it is, um, what I wanna say, uh, how can I say it nicely? <laughs> when it's not racist. <laughs> and um, I think that that's the way that I weave in the, the folklore. 
I wasn't trained as a folklorist per se. I don't have a degree in folklore. My degree is in English, but I did do folklore all the way through. I was, my first folklore, my first academic presentation was at the Texas Folklore Society when I was in my master's program in English. And I continue to have done um, all kinds of folklore kinds of things. My dissertation is on a folk play. Um, a semiotic analysis, by the way. <laughs> so you have all these different uh, trainings, if you will, that are not necessarily in a PhD folklore program. I would love that there be more of those, that people would actually um, be in those programs, trained with the tools of folklore, and then be able to use that for building equity, for dismantling some of the racist structures in our society. And I think in a way, all of us who do this kind of work are doing that. We're kind of being, we're intervening in that whole thing. Okay, so spaces for doing the work. I do it at AFS, definitely. I do it at AWP with my writing and I do it at the MLA with my scholarly interventions. Uh, this is another interesting question that came up. How does your cultural lens influence or impact your writing? Uh, my writing, Canicula and Cabañuelas are novels. I also have poetry. I have some academic scholarly work in folklore. So I think the cultural lens is there no matter what. It's that embodied knowledge. Whatever I'm looking at comes through that embodied uh, cultural lens that I, that I use. So. In Canicula, I have um, the China Poblana, for example, is a traditional dress. It's the epitome of Mexican womanhood. And here you have a picture of my mother wearing it at age 19, and then of me wearing it at age seven. The funny thing is, or maybe not funny, my mother is a Tejana born in Corpus Christi, Texas, and she's wearing this for a, pl at a plaza where it was typical. You would go and put on the dress and take your picture. I am dressed like this for George Washington's birthday. And I'm not sure I'm gonna have time to read um, from that, but I would read the, the, that one. And then if I can share a sample of my writing, uh, yeah, if I can find the book. Ah, here it is. The Miel de Mesquite and my mother's hands probably, we only have a few minutes left. Um, but I, I also would like to say that in Cabañuelas, Nena is a folklorist, as it were, doing research on fiestas in Spain. And so there's several kind of professional, I don't wanna call them academic because it's any profession, conflict about your personal life and also the, the demands of the field what you need to do. And that, I, I chose to focus on that. The original uh, novel did not have that element in it uh, because I did, I experienced that. So I felt others might be doing the same thing. And so I put it in there and I, I think it works. I also use a very traditional event. It's a, like a farmer's almanac, Cabañuelas, where you predict the future as a structure for the narrative. And so it, it just interweaves. <laughs> All the, the folklore stuff interweaves with everything else. Well, I think, you know, what I was particularly struck by um, in Cabanuelas was her, you know, this question where she asks herself, um, am I deluding myself by working on the Fiestas project? What good will it do? Who will it benefit? I should be home working with refugees, preparing for the election. And that felt, I mean, this is in 1980, but it felt very, very relevant to our times now. You know, what, what good does it do to focus on, I mean, I think for students that are interested in folklore or, you know, as you said, folklorists who are constantly asking themselves, you know, what is the value of what I do? Um, I just think that's a really um, important question in thinking about that. And she, and she resolves, I mean, ultimately she goes back and becomes very much of an activist in her community, right? So. Yeah, and I, I also, 
I mean, the alternative ending would have been that she stays in Spain and becomes an activist there. In Spain, right? Yeah. <laughs> because the need is there too. So it's yeah. kind of like uh, six of one, half a dozen of the other. Um, the conundrum happens at the level, of, first of all, of the narrative, what's going to make it interesting as a narrative yeah. and so the whole literary part of it but on the other side for actual lived experience people who have to make choices i hear it all the time from doctoral students i should be out working in a nonprofit. i what am i doing writing a dissertation and those are very serious and relevant and i think important questions to ask yourself i feel like you are driven or have a passion for a particular kind of work and that's the key, follow that passion. I love to read, I love to write. Yes, I am an activist. Yes, I want social change. And I think Nena, of course, shares some of those feelings as well. And the, the conundrum lies in whether one can do all of it. And I think you can. It's not easy, but then a lot of good things are not easy. <laughs> you have to work for it. And it's hard to balance. I find the, some of my students also have the, the conflict about whether they're going to be married and having children or even just having children or not at the point, because of course, when you're in graduate school is when you're also making all these other choices. So um, I always just advise to trust your heart, but with your head. <laughs> so it's a balance. Um, think about mm -hmm. it, but also how do you feel? What is honoring your path? How are you going to fulfill your mission on this earth? Time is very uh, fluid. It goes by really fast. And before you know it, uh, one, another one I, I ask my students, somebody will tell me, well, I'm already 30 years old. What am I doing getting a PhD? I said, well, you're going to be 40 with or without one. <laughs> So what do you want to do? Do you want to be a 40 with a PhD or not? <laughs> and a lot of times that, that perspective of like, oh, yeah, I really want this and I want it for me uh, opens up possibilities, yeah. especially when the work, at least for me, has been incredibly rewarding. And I can tell you great stories of teaching in a literacy program in Laredo that I started only because I could before the PhD, I couldn't have. I tried and it didn't work. Mm. So I think that those are kind of examples of how our work intersects on all levels with what we do. Well, and I think what I, and what I like about, about this is that the study of the fiestas is also about that study of those hauntings and it helps to place any future work into that cultural and historical context, mm -hmm. which just makes it that much more powerful. So we are unfortunately out of time. I am so um, sorry that we don't have more time, but we do. I'm going to paste the um, the link to the cafe into the um, into the chat, so that and we'll jump over there in just a minute. Um, but we need to make room for what's coming up next, um, which is Lauren Hukumer, um, who is the historic preservation officer for the city of Tacoma. And then after that, Roberto Lovato, who is an author that I know you're aware of, Norma, um, author of Unforgetting, a memoir of family, migration, gangs, and revolution in, in the Americas. And then finally at four o'clock, we have the brilliant J. Um, Drew Lanham to wrap up the day. He's a birder, a naturalist, a hunter conservationist, and author of The Home Place, Memoirs of a Colored Man's love affair with nature. So um, I want to thank you again, Norma, so much for um, joining us today. We will jump into the into the cafe and maybe that's a place where you could read one of your pieces. I would so love that might to. be kind of fun. Yeah. Again, so thank you so much. And thanks all of you. I can't see any of you, but I know you're there. So yeah. thank you. Gracias. Yes. And um, I wish you all productive and meaningful activism in your pursuits of equity. So Thank you. We'll see you in a few minutes. So Norma, do you have the 